Again, we'd like to welcome you to our classes this afternoon. Elder Tanner, 3.30 is the current class. And you can see the topic uh, title in front of you. And without further delay, we'll turn the time over to Elder Tanner. This is a kind of an unusual topic, and it's a little different than some of the other presentations I've done. In this particular presentation today, I'm going to go through some ways that I have extended research. One of the things that some people would dream about, I suppose, having that problem would be that on many of my lines, almost all of them to be exact, and that's a lot of lines, and I follow those out as far as I can. They actually end in time frames and in issues that basically are after 41 years of doing this, that become extremely difficult to extend one more generation. So in order to continue to do a lot of research, I do a lot of descendancy research. That means going back to a remote ancestor and verifying that I'm actually related to that ancestor and then researching forward in time to do their descendants. And that turns out to be a, a very, very interesting process. And so I have uh, gone through that with one of the lines that I did just not too long ago and found out a lot of information that I did not know. So we'll get going on this. And the story begins with Charles Godfrey de Vries. He was uh, born in England and uh, joined the Navy and then traveled with his brother who was also in the Navy and a friend. And they came around the world and ended up in Australia. And uh, from Australia, his brother uh, joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and decided to travel to Utah in the United States. And Charles and the other friend, uh, didn't have anything else to do with their lives, and so they decided they'd go with him. And as it came to pass that uh, Charles and his brother and friend did arrive in Utah, and after a period of time, Charles Godfrey de Vries joined the church and then married one of my direct line ancestors' daughters, the Jarvis, into the Jarvis family. And so because of that, he became married to Margaret Jarvis, and then he took, a, and actually formally took her name Char, and became Charles Jarvis. So my ancestors are Jarvises, even though when you go back to my great-great-grandfather, or great-grandfather Charles Godfrey de Vries, he was a de Vries. And you can see there that he was born in Shoreditch, Middlesex, England in 1855. So this is uh, the sort of interesting life of this person who was extremely talented. And one of his great talents was as a photographer. And then his daughter, my great grandmother, Margaret Godfrey Jarvis Overson became a professional photographer. And I ended up with about 4,500 plus images uh, glass negatives and, and uh, photographs and negatives that she uh, took during her lifetime, which now reside in the University of Arizona photography collection at, in Tucson. So there's a, a lot of history and a lot of things going on, but I have to admit that uh, for many, many years, until quite recently, I had not spent any time doing any research on the DeFries line. And the reason for that was that it ended very uh, one or two generations back from Charles Godfrey DeFries. And uh, it was just not, there was just not a lot of information that I was able to find. And so I had not focused on that. The one of the rumors, of course, family tradition kind of things that show up when you look at the family tree as I click back on the family tree was that there was a line of uh, de Friese's going back from, from uh, Charles Godfrey de Fries back through England into Nether the Netherlands and ended up 
with a Jewish rabbi in the Netherlands, and I had not done any research in the Netherlands, and so I was not uh, at that point very familiar with that area and did not want to take on a whole new country as well as a whole new line. So that was kind of the situation. And my great-grandmother, Margaret Godfrey Jarvis Overson, wrote a book about everybody, including back to the last person in the DeFries line, Joseph George DeFries. Uh, and it's a long 700-page book. And this is one of the books that's been digitized and is available on the uh, FamilySearch.org books section on the FamilySearch.org website. So um, you can actually go into the book. Now the good news, the good news is it's a very interesting and informative book and contains hundreds of photographs, photographs, most of which are the, like the ones I ended up with. And on the other hand, there's a lot of information in there that's either incomplete or not as accurate as it could be. So it's it's like many surname books. It is uh, very interesting and helpful in getting a start on uh, investigating a line, but needs to be fact-checked and to be uh, supported with more sources. So this is a, a, a sort of a cautionary tale as well. So basically what's happening here is that uh, she really couldn't find much about the origins of the DeFries family, didn't even know that, but she did basically uh, mention an, uh, someone named Isaac DeFries that could have been a, an ancestor and that he was a Dutch Jew who came to London from Holland in about 1700. To avoid confusion, I'm going to refer to the country as the Netherlands because Holland is uh, only a part of the Netherlands. The Netherlands is actually a group of former countries that have are together, and Holland is merely one of those, although they are referred to as Dutchmen in common words and that they speak Dutch. That at least that's how the Americans use it. Okay, so this is in doing my own genealogical research. It also ended with Joseph George de Vries in England in about 1821. So that was not something that I had addressed as to whether or not that was possible to go further back than that Joseph George de Vries. But what happened over time is that um, uh, the family search family tree, there were other people who did add ex an extensive ancestry back to the 1600s. And so I knew that that was on there when I decided to go look. And so the process was very simple. I started with Joseph George de Vries, who would be at the bottom of this pedigree that's, that's on the screen, and looked to see if there were adequate source citations establishing a relationship, a parent-child relationship, between each step going back in time. So I wanted to know if this was real. It looked like it went back into the 1600s, which it does. And most of the ones I go, I, I look at going back into the 1600s are, uh, let's call them imaginary rather than real. And they very few of them have it, an actual parent-child relationship established by contemporary historical genealogical records that can be that have some value and show a parent-child relationship. It's not unusual to find a break between uh, one of the people going back in a line to the 1600s that where the, the parents have a name, uh, are married and have a marriage record, but there's no, no birth records for any of the children. And so the children are basically added to a marriage of someone that may or may not be a, re a relation. And uh, um, if you want to skip over that and accept uh, the research that's there in the family tree, that's, uh, you know, you can spend a lot of time and probably waste a lot of time in the long run because going back when you have no parent-child relationship supported by a, a source is really kind of launching you out into Never Never Land or fantasy land or whatever you want to call it. So basically that's uh, the question. So I was very surprised actually when I finally started this project to find out that uh, 
there was support clear back to Jacob Abraham to freeze. Uh, there was not an Isaac to freeze in our line. And uh, that was interesting too, because I don't know where uh, my great grandmother Overson came up with the Isaac to freeze person. So now what we have is I was kind of skeptical to all that, even though as I went back, it appeared that there were supporting records for that. And the key to this whole thing was that we took a DNA test from, and this one happened to be from my heritage. And that was an original test that I took from uh, a DNA test. Uh, I have another test from Ancestry, for example, but um, I took the one from, D, from my heritage and it said I had Ashkenazi Jewish DNA and that I went, hmm, well, what do you know? Maybe all of this stuff is actually uh, accurate or at least part of it. And so then I began the process of wondering uh, if this was something that I wanted to pursue uh, in going back and do the, doing the line. And on of all my lines, of all of my ancestral lines, the DeFries line was the only line that would explain a connection that showed that I had Jewish DNA, that there was any kind of connection back there uh, to that in that particular line of, of pursuit. So, well, and, and there's another part of that is that as my heritage refined their ethnicity reports, their what they call ethnicity estimates, uh, the Ashkenazi Jewish line disappeared. So on top of that, I wasn't sure but they did replace it with a, a Western European kind of grouping, which would have included people living in the Netherlands. So it's possible that that is still there, but they, they simply didn't confirm that they were Ashkenazi Jewish line. Another thing that happened is that I uh, became interested, just this is tangentially taking place over a long period of time. I'm, I'm talking years of events that occurred. So this wasn't something that just all of a sudden happened like one day and the next day and all this kind of stuff. It was basically something that uh, uh, over time, these things all occurred and uh, over the last years. And so as those years passed, things came up that I did other checks on. So one thing that I was basically looking at for another reason. And I found a Soundex search page that let me look up surnames, Jewish surnames. And it turned out that DeFries was a fairly common Jewish surname. And so that was another interesting thing, because here we have not only the fact that I was getting a DNA test and that I was also finding surname confirmation that I began to believe at least the fact that I, that I had sur a, a whole line of, of Jewish ancestors. So I wanted to know if that pedigree was accurate. And so instead of just looking at what was there, I began to do my own research on beginning with uh, Joseph, we could be getting actually with Charles Godfrey de Vries. So my idea here was to do more extensive research on each of those people. And uh, the, the way that that appears on the family tree is you get more and more sources. So I began to add additional sources that confirmed each of the lines going back and doing some extensive research on each individual. So it wasn't a matter of jumping back and assuming that all that was correct because there was happened to be a few sources that showed some connections. I wanted that to be verified. So I added as much information as I could. And um, so the whole idea here was that uh, uh, if, as I found it and as I went through it with all of these various different websites that I was able to use and all of the different records that I was able to, to discover that the parent-child relationship was accurate all the way back to Jacob Abraham de Vries, who was born about 1665, and they were all Jewish. 
um, there's no question about the fact that they were all very Jewish. And the and the question was this, and, and what I found, of course, is, and I learned one of the things I learned along the way, is that the uh, genealogical information available in the Netherlands is extremely extensive. I mean, probably as extensive as any country in the world and, and extremely accurate. So it's not impossible to, in fact, it's doable. Uh, of course, you have to know Dutch and you have to know how to read the old handwriting. But once you get into that, and a lot, of, and if you happen to have a Jewish line, you'll end up with all the Jewish names and a lot of stuff in Hebrew. Well, it's fortunate that I have a Hebrew background as well as I have a Western European language background. And so using that and the additional information that I was able to find, I was very much convinced that I, I had uh, an accurate pedigree back to this 1665 person. And I have to remember, you know, this is something that I have to be remind people of when I'm talking about it. It's it's unusual to find an ancestral line back into the 1600s that does not have some serious problems. It's just it's just not as common as you would think. And even though in the family tree, many lines, if you click back, uh, sometimes it's very it depends on you, of course, who you're starting with and who you're actually related to and what part of the world uh, your family came from. But if uh, you connect back to early English ancestors, if you go back to English ancestors or you connect back into uh, some of the other countries in Europe, it, it's very possible that you'll find uh, numbers of lines that go back into the 1600s and even further back in time. And then, of course, those lines become very sus suspect, especially if you if you even superficially look at them and look at the sources that are available and examine the sources to see if there is actually a source showing a parent-child connection on each of those lines. So uh, it's, it's, like I said, on all of my lines that I have and back at that sixth and seventh and eighth and tenth generations where they finally end, and with that issue of there not being a parent-child relationship basis for for going further back, although some of them do go back to Charlemagne and all sorts of people. So that's what happens. And the question usually comes up is, well, what do I do about that? But that's unfortunately going to be the subject of a different and a, has been the subject of different presentations. So uh, in a nutshell, what it is, is you at some point in time, you have to make the decision that that uh, when you do no longer have any source records that substantiate a parent-child relationship, that you can either detach that relationship and leave it open, or you can simply ignore it and let it sit there, even though you know it's not correct. So you have two choices. So along the way, I discovered this major website, and uh, this this website was created by the Center for Research of Dutch Jewry in Jerusalem, and it was affiliated with the Hebrew University. And what they did, and interestingly enough, one of the missionaries that that serves at the BYU Family History Library was on this. Dini Has Hasma was. Uh, who's worked there for over 50 years was at the library has uh, was part of this organization and so this was interesting because here i am at the byu family history library i find this record that shows as information about my ancestry and find out that one of the people that i work with is actually one of the people that produced it so it was uh, i mean it seems like there are really no con co uh, coincidences in genealogy but this was one of those that was quite interesting. And so, uh, according to the website, it was closed in 2020, and it's now on archive.org. It was backed up on this, on the Internet Archive, uh, and it's available as a website. But it seems to be still active, and so um, it's still available, and it's called Dutch Jewelry. The idea here of this website was to substantiate basically all the Jews who came to the Netherlands from the 1600s. 
Now, why did they come in the 1600s? And why doesn't it go back further? And the answer is very simple. Before that time, Spain owned the Netherlands. I'm not going to go into all the dates in history, but it was part of the Spanish Empire. And um, the Spanish people were not at all hospitable to Jews. In fact, in 1492, uh, Ferdinand and Isabel made an order, it basically exiling all of the Jews from Spain, and uh, that was their attitude. They just wanted them all out of the country, and uh, any of them that failed to follow that were either going to be killed or they can convert. And so that was a, a big effort and a big problem. And that extended in, the, in that time frame. And in 1630, had the, the the government had changed and there were no there was no longer uh, a problem with Jews coming into the Netherlands and so they started to move into the Netherlands and and the purpose of this particular website was to track all of those all of the movement of all of the Jews back into the Netherlands so here was the website um and uh this was actually the way it looks when i had, was on on uh, archive.org but the information is still all available and it's all there and uh, it's still searchable and still usable so i was able to use the website and it still seems to be working also at dutchjewry.org so it's very good so what are the elements of this story that i've told so far that will help with genealogical research in general so what are the things that we uh, we have to deal with that uh, are things that we have to in integrate with our overall research and, and the way we approach, which we call methodology, our methodology for, for doing uh, genealogical research and, and having it be accurate. The first one, of course, is we usually start or have, a, in, in many cases, some kind of family tradition. I mean, it could be in this case, my family tradition showed that there was a possible link with a Jewish line in Europe. And that tradition was uh, codified, put in a book uh, that I had uh, a, a access to for mo all my life, essentially. Um, all of I've, my adult life, for certainly. And so it was something that I was familiar with and I understood and uh, for and basically this, that's what it was telling me. Okay, so that's the family tradition. So from the family tradition, I also relied on past research from other relatives. This is the book from my great grandmother and all of the information that had been put into Family Search Family Tree and the predecessor programs and uh, the records that had been submitted for years. Uh, in the form of paper family group records and family group sheets so that these records were all available to me. And, and initially in my research, when I began 41 years ago, I relied almost in, entirely, which is the only way I could have uh, progressed, on family group records that had been submitted to the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. And by going to the library in Salt Lake City and taking and lurking through those paper records, I was able to uh, construct a, a pedigree, which was uh, not quite, I wouldn't call it supported, but it was a skeleton. I don't want to use that term, but it was a, a framework, let's say a better term, for putting together uh, a pedigree. And essentially, uh, when time passed and I had better computer programs and we got the internet and then we got all of the information on the internet and all of the big websites and everything then uh, by through my efforts and the efforts of my children and uh, we've been able to verify back six and seven almost completely seven generations and further in the sense that we've provided records that substantiate parent-child relationships in all of the instances Okay, so that's kind of this how you rest on the past research. Then the next step was uh, the possible DNA connection. Now, why was the DNA connection important? It was important because of two factors. One is 
it's a physical scientific based connection that shows you how how people are connected and on top of that it is something that got my attention because it it came up with er an area of my ancestry that I was not only not familiar with but that I had not done a lot of research in so that was something that was kind of came in out of what you might call left field and and ended up getting me more interested in determining if the information was correct and that was followed by extensive personal research so i needed to go back step by step and verify now what what happened with the dutch jewelry uh, website was that the information in that website was all substantiated by contemporary historical genealogical sources and it's all listed in there all the information was there substantiating the the fact that these that the information that had been included in that study was correct and so that helped to give me a starting point and and being able to see if there was additional information uh, perhaps that had not been incorporated in that particular website so that was the research effort and then the next was this availability of the original historic records enabled this whole process to proceed um, because this would never have happened during the early years when I did not have access to uh, a seemingly endless series of records online records particularly for example all of the the historical and genealogical information from the Netherlands that is not something that uh, with the Netherlands websites that uh, I would have had uh, years ago and absent the fact that I became had an interest uh, I could have done like many of the people that I talked to over the years and that is they say oh dear well my family goes into Germany and I don't speak German and I don't want to worry about it so that's not it but see I I, I guess I had partially that attitude because I said uh, well it goes into the Netherlands and here we go do I want to learn a whole new language in for genealogy there was also now interestingly enough a way that the records were translated from Dutch into English and that that started to assist this dramatically uh, many of the Dutch websites are bilingual English and Dutch and so even doing research original research is facilitated by by the fact that there's these rec records out there now that doesn't happen in every country obviously but in this case it was a factor in what happened here and I would mention that with the current state of of affairs with artificial intelligence and the programs like Google Translate and others other other ways out there now uh, the barrier of having of doing research in a language that you are not necessarily proficient in or even know is uh, is possible uh, the word the word group of words the the vocabulary that you need to know in order to to launch out into a country uh, even one where you have no concept at all of how the language works or what what it is if there are records available then there is a way to translate the records and if there's a way to translate the records there's a way to do the research in that language and build it up and there are a lot of ways to do that family search has word lists for virtually all the major countries that have records uh, genealogical word lists on the Re family search research wiki for example so there are ways to do this and move forward and so what was the next one I also relied on extensive research done by other genealogists who had provided substantial source citations source records that uh, if I wanted to I could examine individually and so that was another step that made this possible and that brought us back to all the resources on the internet that are now available that are starting to create a, a possibility for uh, for anyone willing to put forth the effort and spend the time and the effort to work through the, the what would previously been almost insurmountable barriers to, to finding 
uh, information on these any of these areas. And I could I'm easily going to put that in a category of where I was years ago reading in my grandmother's book that uh, my, that line ended in, in, in England and not uh, did not go any further. So is this the end of the story? Is, in other words, are we through with this process here? And the answer is no, this is the beginning of the story. This is where uh, the actual work of doing genealogy begins because basically as I went through what I've gone through all the way to this point is simply information that was already in existence or somebody had already put and, and the, the, the basis for it was that what was in the family search family tree. So I, you know there's an attitude sometimes out there that uh, that the family search family tree is not reliable in some ways. Now that's that's very wrong. Uh, it's it has information that's not substantiated and not connected properly, and and is probably not accurate. But the basis of when you when you start with a, a part of the tree, and do the verificate go through the verification process, then it becomes uh, extremely valuable because you get record hints, you get additional helps, uh, you get ways of using additional information from other websites so this is uh, you know this is a, a doable thing and using the family search family tree as the basis for this research is is reasonable now what happens when the, uh, the people say well what happens when people come in and make changes well let me tell you there's not anybody making changes to these lines to speak of it just doesn't happen so that's just sort of the information. So yes, it's the beginning, or no, it is the beginning, whichever way you want to answer the question. And so this is the way that you actually get to the point where you're doing uh, original research, adding information that has not been documented previously in the family search family tree. And almost today, and the way that the records are being accumulated around the world, and large websites like my heritage and ancestry and family search and find my past and others the the amount of information that's available now is basically saying we have all this information and, and if you organize it you'll just be able to organize it and use it and that's one of the benefits by the way of artificial intelligence it's an expanded research process that allows you to accumulate more information and by the way, just as a side note, if you are thinking about artificial intelligence as a part of the of the tools you would use, uh, if you're directly using it, it doesn't do a very good job at all. In fact, it comes up with a lot of bad information when you try to find individuals using artificial intelligence. So don't go out and try to build your tree using chat GPT right now because it doesn't work. So anyway, so how many descendants are there from these people, this Jacob Abraham de Vries back in 1665? How many people? This is a descendancy chart on uh, familysearch.org showing these people and all those little purple icons are, are lacks of information on his descendants. Now these people, all these people already are already in the family search family tree. So I wasn't adding huge numbers of names initially because I was looking at what was already there. And this is what was already in, in the family tree when I, uh, a lot of this information was in the family tree when I began. So I decided to see how many descendants surnames there were from Jacob Abraham to Fries. And this is actually a partial list. Uh, it's not all I could possibly find. But these are the people that I was able to find that were listed in the family search tree as potential with surnames that were potentially from this particular one particular person. So what does this really mean when you when you look at this? And this is a little bit intimidating, I realize, to some. But the, the question here is, what does it mean? This isn't all I could possibly find, by the way. There's there's more. I'm sure I would have been able to turn up more surnames and more, more descendants if I had spent even more time 
putting together this huge list of, of surnames. So the question is this, every time you find a new ancestral family or relative family even, meaning a collateral relative, cousin family, you have probably added more possibilities to the family tree. So what that means very, very directly is that you work yourself into work. You don't work yourself out of work when you're doing genealogy. The more genealogy you do, the more you take time to discover this information that's sitting out there right now on the internet in the form of the family search family tree. And every time you spend some time looking at that, verifying the information that's there, uh, examining the sources and looking for further information, you'll find it. And you'll find that you have all of a sudden discovered a, a whole new area. I mean, a whole ancestral line of thousands of potentially thousands of people that is not on the family search family tree. We still aren't. The tree isn't to the point where it is. It has absorbed every person conceivable. It's not even a very, very high percentage of how many people there are. Another thing is to take a, a DNA test with one or two of the big companies. We've had a discussion recently in the genealogical community about uh, how valuable are the DNA matches to tests and, and whether or not there are any tests that are significant for genealogical research. So the question is, there are basically when people start talking about it, there's only two. One is my, my heritage and the other is ancestry. The rest of them do not have a family tree databases that give you enough information to find a significant number of relationships. Now, you might be lucky with, with uh, one of the other websites like 23andMe or whatever and finding some relatives. But this is, these two big websites have a net that's large enough to gather in almost all the people that you might be related to. And so this is, uh, this, and, and the numbers here are not, are not extraordinary. I find people with many more people on these websites than, than my 15,000 here on my heritage. But through this, then you're able to substantiate if you are actually related to those lines. So in other words, if you find their descendants and you've done the descendancy research, then you just start looking and finding additional surnames, for example, is one way of thinking about it. And as you find those surnames, you're adding in more people that are possibly showing up here on DNA matches. And as they do, you can begin to substantiate connections back to your ancestors, which by the way, validates the research that you've done. Because once you have the DNA connections that start showing up with people that otherwise would not be related to you in any way that, you have, that you're aware of, and then all of a sudden you're finding these people from all different countries of the world. And then you basically have uh, all of this uh, of, its, of substantiation through a completely different method of, of developing relationships that is DNA rather than the historical research method of doing research through contemporary historical records. So that's, that's the bottom line because that gives you a thing. So the answer here is don't ever imagine that your genealogy is complete or all done. It just is not complete. It is not all done. You can say, I can't find it. I'm not willing to do the work. I don't have the time. I don't, you know, whatever it is. Those are not reasons that uh, explain what you have. And the most common one that I've run across, and this is probably common only, uh, I'm going to say, among people who are my religious and cultural people of my and my relatives, who basically say that their, their genealogy is complete. 
And I don't have any clues to what they mean by that, but what it usually means is that they don't want to question the fact that they and get into it because they're just not interested. Well, that's basically what it is. But in reality, and I think what this particular uh, line of, of investigation in the DeFries line has shown, dramatically shows, is that there is no way that this is complete. Now, when I had finished doing a lot of the de of the descendancy research of this of these lines, I found a very significant tragedy, uh, something that was unexcusably tragic, and that was that many many of these lines ended in Europe in 1943 and 44 because of the Holocaust, because of they were eliminated, killed by the Nazis during World War II. And that for me was a, an emotional and a realist, I, something that I knew all about it. I knew what it was. I had no problem understanding the magnitude of the horror of the ter terrible horror, but to actually start doing genealogical research on people who were related to me directly, who were part of that was a major issue. And so there's other things. And uh, one thing that is very, very under under part of genealogy that, uh, that cannot be understated is that you will change your attitude towards the world. It, it is world identity changing when you get into doing research in genealogy because you become part of the world and you may never have thought of yourself as part of that world. And so that's what happens as you go through this. So this is the, this is the format for this. And this is kind of an analogous thing showing railroads in the United States. But basically the answer here is you systematically follow each descendancy line down to the present. And that's the, the process that I went through is I would take every, the first child in the, in the remote family and I would do all the descendants, all the descendants, all the descendants down each line, taking each line and then work my way back and then do it again and again and again down each of the, the children in each of the families until I ran out of children and I ran out of names or it hit the, hit that barrier line down at 1945. 43, 44, 45. And then I began the process of doing that again and again. And that's that's now the my basic way of doing genealogical research. Uh, do I ever want to push back any of the fur of the lines that I have? Well, from time to time, as I uh, go back on on uh, the all of the very many pedigrees. You understand, of course, when we're talking about this, that we're here with an exponential number of people. So if I go to 248, 1632, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, et cetera, and those are the number of, of parents just without more marriages or multiple marriages or without all of the other things that go on. And so I'm back that many lines. And, and so I'm always wondering if there's one of them that I could push back maybe one more generation. And uh, so I do that periodically just to see if that's possible. But after spending a certain amount of time and understanding why that was that particular parent-child relationship is not existent, it doesn't exist, I we'll go back to doing the descendancy lines because uh, they're more productive. Okay, so that's that's kind of one of the attitudes. And, and I realize, uh, as I said it right at the beginning, that I'm certainly somewhat unique uh, in the sense of the time frame of the time I've spent and of the efforts that's been spent and the fact that I'm embedded in a culture that has already done a significant amount of, of research. And so it's Based, it's not something that uh, would be very common, but it is something that uh, illustrates a lot of the basic 
challenges and opportunities that exist uh, in, in genealogical research. So one of the things that you would usually is very surprising to people, and, uh, and this is something that I do very, very frequently, is sit down with people who are willing to listen to me for uh, 15 or 20 minutes or an hour or two, and show them how the family tree works. Once you understand that this is a vast, common, universal family tree, it's not someone's family tree, it's not my family tree, it's not your family tree, it's everyone's family tree, then I can sit down with anyone and show them how many people there are available to research and how much information is lacking in the family search family tree, where it ends. And in this case, you can see along here for there's three things that you can look for. First of all, you can look at these descendancies in the family search family tree and see people with a birth date and no death date. Well, they didn't live forever, obviously. Did they live long enough to get married? Did they live long enough to have children? That's the, that's the question. And if they did, where are the children? And once you begin that process, and the other part of this, the bonus of this is that you're researching descendants. You're coming, every time you find a new, a new generation, you're, one, you're coming forward in time. You're more recent. The records, you find more records. And so that means that it, be, it becomes uh, more doable as you go along. Second one is people with no children. They, they show up in the family tree as having a marriage record, but they don't show that there were any children. And so this is obviously someone who has a potential. Uh, not only were they deceased, and we don't know if they ever had any children, but they don't have any children listed. And then the last one is people with only one child. So if there's only one child in the family tree, that's highly suspect because that one child, uh, it's not as common that there is only one child as there is that there are many children in a family. So we may find a lot more people. And every one of the people you find with a new child, that child then becomes a potential for all of their descendants. So you're getting, it's growing faster than exponentially. It grows with by all the number of the numbers of children there are. But in all of this, make sure you find documents supporting a parent-child relationship for each individual. Absent that record, you are at a dead end. That is it. You don't go further and just speculate and pick up somebody from, uh, you know, a census record or something that sounds like they might be related. So it's all based on doing systematic, based on actual contemporary historical records. If there are no records, then obviously when you've done exhaustive searches and can find no more records on the in that area, you're at also at an end of the line. So there's there's ways that all that it ends. But what I'm saying here is that the opportunities far outstrip the ends. So keep looking. Don't give up and take the time and effort to move ahead. And thanks for watching.